You're listening to Something Cheeky, a collection of podcasts where two sisters discuss TV, books, and movies with just enough reverence and far too many pop culture references. Welcome to Something Cheeky, the Gentleman Bastards edition, where we discuss the lies of Locke Lamora, book one of the series by Scott Lynch. I'm Nikki. I'm Rosanna. Well, I've read the entire series, Rosanna has only read up to what we're covering today, which is chapter seven, Out the Window. In this chapter, Locke gets down with the sickness and crashes into the middle of an affair. Rosanna, what was your reaction to this chapter? So I thought it was a little funny that this chapter and also the interlude, the titles were extremely literal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wasn't I wasn't sure last week when we talked about it if they were going to be or, lo- or not, but they definitely were. I found this chapter a little frustrating, actually. Okay, I believe that. It was short, and it was amusing, but there just wasn't much to it. We didn't get anywhere. Nothing furthered the story, really. Yeah, I was really expecting to go farther, you know, to maybe the confrontation or I don't know, this just felt like a a sort of commercial break. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a comedy of errors at parts. Yeah. Just a really bad timing and everything going wrong. Did it feel almost like a little relaxing, comforting, hilarious filler piece before we get to the really deep horrible, serious stuff. I could see that maybe that's what its purpose was. But for me, only getting a chapter a week, that <laughs> yeah. that doesn't work for me. I, I want <laughs> more substance. Action. Yeah, this felt a little light. Okay. Yeah, this was a really short chapter. Yeah. What was your favorite quote this time, if you had one? My, <laughs> I did. <laughs> How could you not with this chapter? <laughs> um. The quote that I picked is Locke. It's towards the end. He's talking to the woman from the fifth floor. And he says, For the love of the gods, madam, can you please pick one man in your bedroom to cheer for and stick with him? (laughs) Which I totally agreed with him. Uh She was all over the place. Oh, yeah. And they're... And the thing is, Locke and also the twins and and Jean even, too, they're so quick-witted. I just love their lines. And even when they're frustrated, they're still funny. (laughs) I'm actually going to tell you a quote that I had as a favor from this one. Okay. Just because I loved it so much and we we don't get a ton from Bug all the time. Yeah. He's such kind of a background character. He just kind of pops in every once in a while. But he was eating the, the tarts that they made the apple tarts with the Mm -hmm. Oster Shelvin brandy that were worth a lot of money. Yes. He said, look at me, he said with his mouth half full. I'm worth more with every bite. (laughs) It was just so cute. I had to to mark that one. He is cute. I'm trying to think of who we cast as Bug in the movie that we make in our heads. Yeah. Somebody not very old. That might be hard to do. That is hard. It would probably be the actors, you know, one of their first jobs because we have to start so young. Though I want to cast the girl that plays Lady Lady Mormont in Game of Thrones in everything mm-hmm. that needs a young person. Oh my gosh. I don't care what gender, she needs to be every character. She's so good. Oh my god, her side eye is the best. That reminds me, um, I just read a little article before we started recording. They put out some promo pictures from the next season of game of thrones and it doesn't start until i think july but one of the pictures is her oh nice so i'm so excited that she's gonna have something at least one scene Mm -hmm. (laughs) in the next season because she's great i have a feeling she's gonna do really well in every other show because she's gonna get picked up because she's just been so viral yeah yeah every picture of her from the show is so great how can you not love her Mm mm-hmm yeah, I agree with Great that. Great casting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's get into the action. Okay. So we only have kind of three main parts of this chapter. We've got the Black Apothecary shop, the Broken Tower rooms, and the Vine Highway. We have a really short piece in the burrow where they're they're all eating. And then they mm-hmm. basically immediately go on their way to all do their, their parts to get this started. Mm-hmm. We meet the Dobarts, the Black black apothecaries they work Mm -hmm. above a scribes collective which was a really nice picture of all the people writing furiously yeah i would like to work there too i wouldn't i'd get tired (laughs) after a while probably don't get to write whatever you want you have to write very specific things i'd be all right with that i wonder if they're just writing contracts or writing things for people who maybe are illiterate or i'm not really sure what the literacy it rating is in Mm -hmm. kimura i don't know Mm -hmm. i bet it's a combination maybe 
I mean, I, I bet they write just whatever needs their customers have, you know? I really wanted some sort of Harry Potter type magic scrivenering going yeah. on. I always want some kind of Harry Potter magic something <laughs> going on. <laughs> it does seem like a waste of a Bonds match mage. It does. Yeah. But yeah. do you have to do? They've got to eat too. <laughs> mm -hmm. The Sans twins get up to the apothecary shop after they bribe the guard at the bottom of the stairs. It's a nice way to make some money, I guess. Just stand at stairs and look scary for a while. Oh, okay. Never mind. That's what I want to do. <laughs> I don't want to work in the writing shop. I just, just want to get money people. for standing there. <laughs> <laughs> Conspicuously fingering your weapons. Exactly. I was kind of sad at the description of the shop because there's nothing on display. Mm-hmm. When I first read this, I, I was really sad too because I imagined it to be what, what all the shops look like in like Skyrim. Basically, the, they have all these apothecary shops and they are full of stuff. You would because, expect that, yeah. Yeah, just like bottles everywhere, ingredients mm -hmm. all over the place. Because I steal everything, of course. Of course. Is there. <laughs> so this kind of place if you showed up at there would be nothing for you to steal so you'd be very no, frustrated it would be terrible can't even get behind the counter yeah i can see why though that they do it this way they mm -hmm. don't want to give away their hand they you know oh yeah i can see why they're secretive and that makes sense well and it's also it sounds like a pretty illegal business so if someone came right there's definitely stuff in there they're not supposed to have right yeah so they wouldn't see they wouldn't have to hide everything mm-hmm when someone was coming. They're still very careful. They've got the crossbow pointed at the twins, which does not stop them from hitting on, I assume, the younger of course, woman, the daughter. Which, okay, and also, they're obviously familiar with them, and they still have the crossbow on oh, them. Yeah. So there's a definite paranoia <laughs> from these women, which, again, I can understand. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the way that the Sansa twins hit on her, too, they say, we are still very much available. Mm -hmm. Which makes me wonder... Do the Sansa twins do everything together? Oh, I hope not. Let's not. Let's. <laughs> <laughs> I, the women at the, or the, the woman at the Gilded Lilies seemed to speak in the same sort of way. That's true. Hmm. Or there, is there some sort of Vikings threesome going on here every time they go anywhere? I'm going to hope that at least at that point they do part company. <laughs> <laughs> Up until that point, maybe no. But they do play cards together and they travel together. And, and I think it works for them because they they want people to not know which is which. I think that yeah, that's true. works for them. And so they probably appear in public together if, if it's with people that, you know, they have more of trust with. But then that way with other people that they don't know very well, they don't realize there are two of them. Oh, maybe. I mean, I think they're really careful about who sees them both. You know what I mean? I don't know. I wonder, too, if they uh, do that sort of thing, hitting on women together as a way for both of them to have an equal chance. Like, if she goes for one of us, awesome, we're going to try it for both if we get a bite. <sighs> yeah, and so here's the thing, too, about these twins, is that I, I have not noticed a difference in personality between them. <laughs> That's true. And And I don't, and I often don't know who's who. I mean, I, they're not, they're not distinguished in my mind i don't think they've been distinguished in the book we haven't even heard of any scars that have differentiated them or physically or, yeah or the way they t i mean it seems like they talk the same way their mannerisms are the same they treat people the same way they obviously look the same so i i'm not super fond of that in in writing where you have twins that don't have their own because twins in real life are, are two separate people yeah you know, they don't do everything together. They don't think exactly the same about people. It doesn't really give them much of a chance to be individuals at all. That's true. It is a bit disappointing. They don't They don't even seem to have their own interests separate yeah. from each other. They both play cards. Yeah, and that's why I could never figure out which one we're talking about. It's either Cal or Galdo because they're the same. It would be nice if they had at least something to distinguish them a little bit. I agree. I wonder if Locke and Jean ever get mixed up between the two of them still. Well, I would hope when they're with their family, which I, I consider Locke and Jean and Bug their family, when they're with them, they have more of their own personalities. But we we haven't we seen that. We never see that. No. I would really like to. I don't know. Now I'm disappointed. <laughs> I didn't know I wanted that, but now I do. Right. 
<laughs> because, you know, when you're talking about, you know, how I always compare them to Fred and George Weasley in the Harry Potter series, Fred and George Weasley are also very similar and they finish each other's sentences and they spend a lot of time together. But even those two, every once in a while, have their own individual, you know, pieces. Like when you read about them, you're like, yes, this is Fred and this is George. Oh. Not a lot um, because I think it's just easy. It's – I don't want to say it's lazy writing, but, I mean, you're not making two separate characters. It's not incredibly common, I think, for other background characters of any type to get – a huge number of their own interests so it makes sense that they wouldn't that's be that's true very different i just would like a little bit yeah yeah because also so so what if you have these twins hitting on you how could you possibly decide which one you're interested <laughs> in if they're exactly the same that's true i guess it's it all you. or nothing i don't know i guess oh i hope not <laughs> <laughs> both or nothing oh god <laughs> <laughs> we learn Locke's going to use an old standby and basically just call in sick. Okay, so when we get to this point, I was like, mm -mm. oh, that seems <laughs> way simpler than anything that I thought they were. I thought it was going to be a big complicated thing. And he's just like, I'm just going to be sick. I'm like, okay, all right. That simple works in this situation. Yeah, I know. I was imagining, I, I think at one point I said, a hologram. <laughs> <laughs> Lock there, or even him going and being there and then leaving and pretending like he's still there or some sort. Or like one of the other gentleman bastards saying, well, I'll just be you. I'll pretend to be you or I'll, you know, we'll pretend to be the Grey King and you can be you or whatever. And he was like, no, I'm just going to be sick. <laughs> I think Lynch tricked us because yeah, so much of this book, all the schemes are so complex yes. that we immediately jump to the most confusing possible way to do something. Yeah, he definitely really built it up. Answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're going to make Locke incredibly sick, deathly sick, like Romeo sick. <laughs> There's a red pouch, which makes Locke vomit, which has a great part with the twins. They're wondering how potent it is. Mm -hmm. And she says that, have you ever seen anyone feign vomiting? And they immediately answer in unison, yes. Remembering <laughs> Locke when he was a little kid, pretend to vomit with the orange peels and all that. He had this thing with the oranges. <laughs> yeah. And then there's the pine bark, which he gets second, which will make him better, but he'll still be pretty weak. Right. We also learn when we're in the shop that there's a lot of paranoia after Nazca's murder in the city. Just yes. everyone's on lockdown. People are not leaving at our houses. They're just kind of hiding away. Yeah. At least the right people are. I doubt anyone else has noticed. I wonder if the rest of the city, if regular people have noticed what's going on in the crime world. I bet not. Or not much anyway. I wonder if regular crime has gone down at all because people are worried about getting caught by the Grey King. Oh, maybe Especially so. after Nazca's murder. Mm -hmm. Maybe so. Because you think if you're sort of lower down the ladder and the daughter of the Kappa, you know, is murdered, then... It, and you're not nearly as important as she was. Yeah. Uh, I could definitely understand wanting to lay low. Yeah. We get to the broken tower room and Locke and Jean are there. And Locke drinks his magic medicine. When I, when I was reading this section, all I could think of was the Incubus song, Magic Medicine, because there's... It's this from their old album called Science, which is actually amazing. But they... There's this one song called Magic Medicine, of course. And at the very end, there's this woman. They have a little recording and it just says... The magic medicine worked. And that's what I thought of right before he started throwing up. Yeah. <laughs> that was horrible. Oh, man. That poor guy. And even when he was getting sick and just totally miserable, he was still saying funny stuff. Like the whole thing about how he thought he threw up his soul. <laughs> and he asked Gene yeah. to look for it. And Gene's like, no, it's all, what do you say, shrunken and black. And it's fine. We're just going to throw it out, too. <laughs> I am not... <laughs> at all amusing when I am throw up sick. <laughs> Not even close. There are no jokes. So I can attest to that being true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a miserable way to feel. And it's not only a miserable way to feel, but it takes so much out of you. Whether it's legitimate or not, it's throwing up. It's That takes a lot of, of your strength. 
And this was really incredibly horrible, violent, extended yeah. growing up. Yeah, everything he'd eaten for, what, like a month or something? Yeah, they that's said. what he said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Poor kid. And Gene said he looked like he had lost 20 pounds and gained 20 years. Well, and yeah, and I was going to say, it's not like Locke has a lot of extra yeah. anything, to, you know, to just be giving it up, so... Oh, one thing I noticed that they mentioned when Gene was looking out the window, he said the Iron Sea city-states were at relative peace, so there weren't warships being built. Mm-hmm. And that maybe it reminded me of the problem in Emberlane, where it sounded like there's a civil war coming. Yeah. And so I wonder how long the peace is going to last, or if anything from Emberlane is going to spill over into Camor. I feel like it has to. I mean, that kind of stuff, it, it doesn't stay contained, usually. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure how to say his name. Maybe Anjias Barsabi, the oh. son mm-hmm. of the Kappa, who yeah. arrives. And we don't find out until he's leaving that he's the son of the Kappa. Right. I'm kind of surprised the Kappa sent his son to go get Locke. I was too. Yeah. I mean, it's just Locke. I mean, he was supposed to marry Nazca, but still, that's... Right. Also, with Nazca just being murdered, I would think the Kappa would want to keep his remaining kids very close. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Because... Well, and also, the Kappa expected Locke to come. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. He didn't have any indication that Locke wasn't going to. So why was he? Why did he need to send a son to fetch him? You know what I mean? Unless he had some suspicion that he wasn't coming. Maybe he wanted him to have an escort. Ah, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm having a hard time seeing what his motivation was there. I don't, yeah. yeah. I'm thinking about trying to think if there's any reason I can come up with, and I can't. I, yeah, I don't know either. Unless Locke has suddenly become far more important to the Kappa in his, his own mind than he realized before. And so he's really trying to get him basically escorted. I guess. But I mean, what? I haven't seen anything that would give him pause to worry that Locke's not coming. I mean, why why would he be worried about it? Yeah, I don't know. We get a moment of, of guilt from Locke at the end of that part, too. He's wondering if the way they're feeling is the way their marks usually feel after they've absconded with all their money. Yeah, I've been feeling that way for a lot of this book. <laughs> I mean, every time he's dealing with the Dawn, I'm like... But does the Don deserve this? <laughs> Did any of them deserve this? <laughs> I feel bad for the victims here. And so I guess he's finally, yeah, he's finally uh, realizing that when he runs away from them with their money, you know, what are they left with? What are, how do they feel? And I mean, he never thought of that before now. He's never looked outside himself enough to realize how other people feel. Well, and also, you know, this is how he was raised from pretty young. And so this has been his way of life. So why is he all of a sudden now feeling that? You know what I mean? I'm guessing that a conscience and thinking of other people over yourself and their feelings probably interferes a lot with his line of work. So it's best not to have that. So you think he's just been pushing it down? Maybe. Just like ignoring it if it ever tries to pop up? It hasn't been helpful so, yeah. Until yeah. he had to deal with it himself. Yeah. Hmm. And they're obviously very mad at the Grey King for putting them through this. Yes. I would be too. Though they know they still have to wait for the Falconer to be done with this whole situation before they can do anything about it. Right. Which even then, I, I don't know. I don't think he's the right guy to mess with. Oh, the Grey King? No, the Falconer. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't think the Grey King is either, but I would be more afraid of a Falconer. Oh, yeah. Definitely. There's a part where it says, Gene's voice was steady and totally empty of emotion. The voice he always used when discussing a plan only loosely tethered to prudence and sanity. Mm -hmm. Which is just another time we get to see what Gene really thinks about everything that's happening. Yeah. Which we don't see very often, but every once in a while it peeks out there. Yeah, I like that. I like Gene. Mm -hmm. He often feels very mother hen to me. Yeah. And to me, he seems like the most cautious or or thoughtful maybe it makes sense he'd be the most cautious because if it comes to a fight he's going to be the one fighting that's true that's a good point yeah yeah he's probably going to be taking the brunt of it well and i think maybe we sort of get that too because we know that he's a reader and so that just automatically makes you think that he thinks more i don't know is that just totally like (laughs) crazy but like you know that he thinks things yeah, and he thinks things through maybe a little more. Um, Locke and the twins, and definitely Bug, seem 
sort of spontaneous, like fly by the seat of our pants. I mean, I know they do a lot of planning before they start stuff, but I think that once they're in the middle of it, Gene is thinking more steps ahead than maybe the other guys are. He's the chess player. Exactly. Yes, that's a really good way to put it. I think so. I like thinking of him as the, not just the conscience of their operation, but the kind of the comfort when everything's over. Yeah. I think that if the gentleman bastards were in the office, Gene would be uh-huh. the person who did the birthday celebrations for everyone. He <laughs> made and sure that around the car cake yeah on his birthday he never got a cake or a card because no one else remembered Aww. his but he remembered everyone else's yeah maybe but i do feel like though that the other guys probably do care enough about gene to pay attention to that kind of stuff to give him the whale cake for his birthday yeah to yeah to give him something <laughs> for sure and i think too that i don't know what it was like before father chains died but when he did he had sort of responsibilities and and things that he took care of that each of them maybe had to take parts of oh yeah and maybe maybe gene took on the you know the more thoughtful the more parental maybe you know and Locke is is you know planning and picking out the people and you know that kind of stuff but when father chains died i think a lot of the stuff that he did had to be picked up by the other guys do you think we're gonna see when father chains died and see what actually happened or the funeral or anything i hope that we see him die i mean that's a horrible thing to say uh, <laughs> we already know he's dead so <laughs> yes i very much hope that we have an interlude that talks about his passing i want to know why and you know circumstances around it and and you know it gives us more insight into the guys when we see their reactions to stuff like that that's true see the emotions and i don't know maybe Callow and galdo will respond differently and we'll be able to assign them a personality (laughs) 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 i wonder if i wouldn't be surprised if when father chains died a lot of people noticed yes and they suddenly made more money or they just disappeared from the steps for a while that could be yeah i could see that because he really had a lot of people fooled about what he was sitting Mm -hmm. there for and he was very well known yeah definitely onto the vine highway which i really enjoyed it's a name for something okay and when i read that i was expecting a road (laughs) and then they started climbing out the window and i was like wait is that the vine oh you guys (laughs) i see (laughs) i love that they think they're basically the only people that use it and they're very wrong about that yeah they're like yeah this is our own special thing we even have a name for it but other people are climbing out probably all the time yeah oh i'm sure and they use it just to avoid people in the last mistake down right. stairs and of course they have horrible timing <laughs> which is weird because they don't usually <laughs> no <laughs> this was just really bad luck mm-hmm. things were not working out for them mm-hmm. at all no they meet forens mm-hmm. who is not centaur forens from harry potter He's a different person. Boo. It was spelled differently, I guess. Yeah. Forens from Harry Potter is spelled like fire. It has an I in it. F-E. Too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We learned that the trellis cannot hold three people. <laughs> and it starts to fall down like a ladder in an infomercial. Mm-hmm. Like the before segment. <laughs> yes. It's all very comedic. Yes. They're And they're high up, though, so it's also scary. Yeah. They're five floors up. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Gene and Locke make it inside. Poor Ferenz does not, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And then one part Gene giggles uncontrollably when they get inside and he sees what's going on with the woman inside and the mm-hmm. big man comes in. Yeah. And again, I think this has happened before. It made me think of Cheyenne from Superstore. Just so uncomfortable oh. and had to giggle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This was a weird situation for them to try to figure out how to get out of oh yeah which they did a good job well it's such a trope the the affair partner climbing out the window when the husband comes in yeah and this just adds a completely new element to that yeah two guys at once (laughs) (laughs) it was so mad there was another one in here too (laughs) well of course it would take two to make up for me i mean (laughs) so manly (laughs) oh god yeah so of course even though he's quite large and drunk gene takes him down seemingly seemingly pretty easily yes yeah and then the woman wants him thrown out the window come on lady what What is her she was a weird person yes i mean she had some weird stuff happening (laughs) why would you just want somebody thrown out the window 
Especially because she's, didn't she say something about how he wasn't going to remember anyway? No, she thought he'd remember. Jean said he wouldn't remember. Oh, okay. Okay. So she was just going to have his head cracked open so he wouldn't yeah. remember. Or just get rid of him as a problem in her life. I, I guess. You could just yeah. break up with him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I would be comfortable breaking up with somebody like that. He's pretty that's, scary. That's a good point. And they get outside. And Ventress appears. Yes. Off in the distance. In the next episode, we're going to discuss the interlude, Up the River. But before we move on, I wanted to say hello to all of our listeners. We have some new listeners from Australia and Newfoundland. Hello! We're so happy to have you. <laughs> and from really great places, too. Definitely. I went to Newfoundland a couple of years ago, and... The locals in St. John's are serious badasses. <laughs> I hiked I hiked up on Signal Hill, which is this big old hill up on the corner. It's on the side of the ocean. And there's this, okay, for me, there's a very precarious kind of path. It uh -huh. has uh, handles or uh, railings on most of it. But there are a couple parts where you hold on to this chain that they have hammered into the side of the rock. And that's all you've got to hold on to. And you're on just the side of a uh, rocky hill really high up over the water. There are these little kind of crevasses and things. It's terrifying. That sounds terrifying. <laughs> and I was holding on, walking very slowly around this curve. I bet. People, people who apparently live there were jogging past <gasps> me. Just not holding on to anything. Just flitting off like they're freaking Legolas. It was ridiculous. Wow. I was very impressed and yet scared for them. Yeah. I'm surprised nobody died. But <laughs> wow. it was amazing. I guess they're just so used to it. But still... I would love to go there. That sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, Newfoundlanders, you're amazing. And I love you. <laughs> and I want to be just like you. But I'm too scared. <laughs> <laughs> but I know also uh, Australia stuff. Australia has so many actors. A lot of people that I don't even realize are Australian most of the time because they're so good at concealing their accents. They really are. Like, uh, who's the... Who's Bones in the new Star Trek? Uh, I don't know. I want to say Keith Urban. That's Keith Urban's it's a country not Keith singer. Who <laughs> <laughs> so I also like. <laughs> that just makes me think of the actor from um, Star Trek that died. That yeah. was Odd Thomas. Oh, so sad. So sad. He was so young. I loved him. I really liked him too. But he wasn't Australian. No. I didn't even know the guy that did Bones was Australian. They're so good at non-Australian accents. I mean, they sound super American when they try. They're really good. So Chekhov, who, or the guy who played Chekhov in the new Star Trek uh -huh. movies, is Anton Yelchin. Yeah. Who did a really great job as he, Bob Thomas. Yes, he did. Yeah, I liked the movie. I loved the books. Anyhow, the Dean Koontz books. Definitely, so yeah. But I'm so sad that he's gone. I watched a movie recently called five to seven with him in it and he was the star of it oh and the whole time i was just like you're never gonna make another movie it's really depressing because i really like him i like him too and you know what i feel that way every time i see a heath ledger movie Ugh. i yeah. was so sad when he passed away i love him so much every time i watch a knight's tale i'm like i'm struggling between so excited and happy because I love that movie so much and then <laughs> so, so much fun. yeah it is and so sad I just that movie is so great because of Heath Ledger and then also because they use modern music yeah like it was fun yeah like Queen also Paul Bettany oh he's so great I love Paul Bettany <gasps> I do too Everybody's amazing you know what? I totally loved him in The Avengers. I'm not even going to deny yeah. it. I thought he was great. I like Avengers. I'm a nerd. Pretty sure Avengers has, has surpassed the nerd status and gone into just general pop culture area. Okay, so people who are like hardcore, major, super comics people probably would judge me pretty harshly because... <laughs> they know everything about everything, and all I know is what I know from the movies. And they're like, no, that's not accurate, and that movie wasn't good, and blah, blah. I don't even care. I go, and I sit for an hour and a half, and I watch action and comedy and all the great stuff, and I just love it. And I don't even tear it apart or pick it apart or anything. 
I like watching movies made from things I love, books and yeah, and all different sorts of things that I love. And I'm fine with them being different. I kind of like it when they're different. Yeah, I'm okay with it I, usually. I experience them in different ways. Mm -hmm. If they're too similar, that's when I start really picking it apart. That's true. Like this one little thing was off and this was off. But if they have enough different, different things going on, mm -hmm. I feel better about it because I can experience them in completely separate contexts. Yeah, I could see that definitely. Yeah. Carl Urban. It wasn't Keith Carl. Urban, it was Carl Urban. Carl Urban is who? Oh, he was Bones. Oh, Bones. On okay. Star Trek. Got it, got it. Carl Ur Urban. I could see why you could get confused and say Keith. That makes sense. Their names are very similar. And so they're both Australian. Is Keith Urban Australian? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Isn't he? I'm I, sure I he know. is. He's married to Nicole Kidman. Maybe they're related. And she's definitely she Australian. She's definitely Australian. Is everyone Australian? Everybody Am cool I Australian? is. <laughs> no, because you're not cool. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man. So there was a thing about Carl Urban and Leonard Nimoy before he passed. He obviously was in the the new Star Trek films, and he talked to Carl Urban at one point and said he appreciated his acting in the movie so much because it reminded him so much of his old friend who died the original. Oh. Yeah, which was really sweet. That is sweet. I think Carl Urban had that he had that character down. Oh my, oh my gosh. The um casting for the new Star Trek movies, I thought is the best I've ever seen. Yeah, it was really good. They did such a great job picking those actors. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people from Australia that I would love to be in our Gentleman Bastards movie. <gasps> yeah. So many. I uh, I talked with you before, uh, Eric Bana, we think would make a good Duke if he ever shows up. Definitely. It would be very nice. He would. And I didn't realize he was Australian. I didn't know he was either. Yeah. But the I had been trying to think of who would make a good Nazca, and it's Alicia Debnam Carey, mm -hmm. who was Lexa on The 100. Mm -hmm. She's also been in Fear the Walking Dead. She would be perfect. She has the look. She has the sass. She's got the whole package. She's I think she'd so be pretty. Yeah. I'd be really sad that she wouldn't be on very long. I know. Basically, a yeah. scene or two of her. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And then she'd play a dead body, but still. Well, she'd probably do a good job at that, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I couldn't think of anybody that would be good as Sabatha, because all we know about her is that she has red hair. So that all I can think of is Isla Fisher, but I don't mm. know quite so much. I was thinking, like, um, not Australian, but uh, Scottish, what's her name? Karen um, Gillum or Gilliam? She was on she? Doctor Who. Oh, I never watched And Guardians Doctor of Who. the Galaxy. She was the bald sister of the bad guy oh. or the daughter of the bad guy the sister of the green girl i like her I have, a lot. i can't picture her with hair it's long and red <laughs> well okay it was long and red when she was on doctor who <laughs> oh okay yeah and she's scottish which also i'm obsessed with that accent i love it so much <laughs> so yeah All right, Rosanna, what is your top three category this time? This week, I picked women we actually meet. Holy crap. Yeah, we like doubled our number of female characters. So yeah, we haven't met very many women in person. We've heard about some women, but we actually get to meet uh, three in this chapter. So Jessaline, Janelaine, is that how you're saying it? Janelaine? I think so. And then unfortunately, uh, the fifth floor woman who didn't get a name. <laughs> yes. The we two met her got names, but she didn't get a name, and which I was a little irritated about. She was called two different things. She was called bitch by the man she was cheating with and the man she was cheating on. Ah, and then Locke called her madam. I appreciate that. I did too. I appreciated that a lot. So we got Jessaline, who is the mother, said she's in her mid fifties and she has long dark hair, and then Jan Janelaine uh, is her daughter. And she's half her mother's age. That's literally all the description we got of these women. <laughs> I was glad to see more women, but there's, I mean, they're just blank faces in my head right now. We just don't get very much description. And physical physical descriptions, we don't actually get a lot from That's true. any of the characters. So we met three new women. Unfortunately, only two of them got names. Guess we have to take what we can get. I suppose so. <laughs> but those were three, th three things that stood out for me in this chapter because there wasn't a whole lot of new information. That's true. So that's what I came up with. Yeah. So speaking of not much new information, what do you expect to happen next? Oh my gosh, would they please just get to the face off? <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm really eager to read the next chapter because I can't imagine that there's any more stalling. <laughs> Just get to it. John Travolta and Nicolas Cage have to show up first for this face-off. Ooh. Okay, that movie, so many people are like, oh, it's not good or whatever. But I thought it was a really good movie. I've tried <laughs> several times to get my children to watch it. And they said, so what's it about? And I said, well, there's these two guys. <laughs> one's a good guy and one's a bad guy. And the bad guy's brother went to prison and he's supposed to go to prison. And the good guy's like a cop. And so the cop is going to go into prison. And so they take off their faces and they put them on each other. And the kids go... They do what? <laughs> and I said, they switch faces. And they're like, their actual faces? Yeah, they cut off their faces and they put them on each other. And the kids are like, why would we watch that? <laughs> and I'm like, no, it's really good. Oh, so That movie was really fun to watch, but it ignored so many plot holes. Oh, it was like, completely unrealistic. Was totally different. <laughs> was, also, their bodies I mean, very, very yeah. different. But you know what? It, it's an entertaining hour and a half. It's true. It, it really was. And Nicolas Cage, I thought, had some really <laughs> good lines in that movie. He was really funny. He was really sarcastic. And that was back when Nicolas Cage was still really cool. He, he's not as much now, or really at all, yeah. unfortunately. He's gone a little weird. But back then, he was still real big. So I've never really been a fan of John Travolta, but I really liked when he was playing. So John Travolta was playing the cop played by Nicolas Cage's character. Yes. So when he was pretending basically to be Nicolas Cage, he that was, was, he really, was a bad guy. I really liked that. Yeah. 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 I thought he did a good job with that, too. Mm hmm. I go back and forth with John Travolta. I'm like, eh, I mean. Ah, I'm just, ugh. Ugh, whatever. I did enjoy the recent Saturday Night Live sketch where Jimmy Fallon played 1970s John Travolta and modern John Travolta in Family Feud and <laughs> running back and forth and changed his, his wig. I have it not seen great. that, but that sounds really funny. <laughs> At one point you see the teeny little bit of the top of his head because he's running from one side to the other in oh front of the camera. Oh my gosh. It was pretty good. That's funny. He, didn't, he wasn't actually that funny himself, but the action of him changing back right, and forth was Right, the funny. running back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm not expecting actual physical uh, exchanges of faces that's it, good. It, in the next couple chapters, or really <laughs> at all. Um, so I'm not sure what we're going to get, but I don't think it'll be that. <laughs> well, we didn't see Locke do anything but a, basically just a clothing change. He hasn't done any changes with his face yet. Yeah. Do you think, what do you think he's going to do to look like someone different? <sighs> I don't know. I'm going to stop in an alley and apply some prosthetics? Or... At the very end of this chapter, he says something to the effect of, we're under the protection of the falconer now. It's, it's kind of what he's alluding to. Or maybe he actually just flat out said that. <laughs> I think he did. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't allude to it. He said it. So <laughs> so I wonder if part of... Because we know the Falconer can confuse people. Maybe he's going to do something to where what they're seeing is not actually what is there. So I haven't heard Locke actually talk to the Falconer beyond what happened previously. But he though. said he's going to protect him. But I don't know if... He's plans for a disguise. They, they really haven't. I, I feel like I don't... they're expecting... To lock to completely handle that no. as the thorn would right well i mean that's true i mean he's obviously shown that he's very good at that so maybe they're just gonna i still don't know if the gray king wants lock to make it out of this alive or not so it's a good question i don't know <laughs> what do you think what's your gut honestly right now i could go either way i just don't know where this guy's coming from yeah I'm worried about Locke because Locke is obviously a really big character because the book's named after him. But it's true. The Grey King and Kappa Barsavi, Locke is not the lead in their lives. <laughs> That's true also. So I don't I don't know where he fits into it, especially with the Grey King. I just don't know where he stands. Mm -hmm. Do you think the Grey King knew about Locke as the thorn before he started? All of this with the Kappa? Or was that just a lucky thing that he found out uh, so that he was able to use for his own games? Yeah, since I still don't know what the Grey King's ultimate plan is, all I can guess is that he found out about Locke, um, found out about 
what he's been doing these past several years and the Gentleman Bastards as a group um, and decided that that was going to work for him somehow okay. and and maybe sort of form- formulated some of his plan around that. But you don't think that in the beginning Locke was an integral part of his his plan for all this. Well, I think it just became that way after he decided to have the meeting, maybe. No, no, no. I think it was before that. Okay. Yeah. I, I think he knew about Locke at the start of his plan when he started killing okay. uh, Garistas. Uh-huh. Garistas? Garista. Yeah. I, I keep thinking like barista. <laughs> <laughs> like we run mobs and we also make coffee. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. We're I think, all Starbucks here. I, more. <laughs> I think that when he started his plan this however many weeks ago when he started killing people he already knew he was going to be using lock interesting okay yeah any other predictions i hope nobody dies okay <laughs> i hope uh i especially <laughs> think that's likely i especially hope none of the gentleman bastards die okay here's the thing uh, about that being likely or not uh i did not think uh nazca was gonna die that's, yeah that was a surprise that was a shock to me so it makes me feel like nobody's safe oh yeah who do you think is the least safe? If somebody does die in the next chapter, who do you think it is? Capo Barsavi. Okay. Yeah, he would be top of my list. I mean, I think other people are going to die also, but they're going to be people we don't know their names. They're going to be, you know, nah. his hundred soldiers or whatever. But I think if anybody important is going to die, it's going to be Capo Barsavi or maybe one of his sons. Ah. We haven't met the second one yet. Right. But there are two, correct? Yeah. So I I know the Falconer is going to make it out fine because he protects himself. I, I'm hoping that Bug being hidden will be fine. Um, I'm not sure where the twins are supposed to be during this uh, face-off. So I don't know. Yeah, we haven't heard that part. How of safe they are. Yeah. Uh, I think Gene's going to be okay because he knows how to protect himself. And, and the cu- last couple of interludes have shown us that. That he's been trained to protect himself. Did we hear in a previous chapter that during this meeting is when the twins were going to go and get all their money and uh, get it out the gate? Oh. Or was that, that yeah, that could before be. this? Okay. Well, I, I think Locke had to said to, to get, to sort of get their stuff in order, but I'm not sure timeline wise where he was at with that. Okay. And also it's not like. You know, somebody penciled in an appointment. We're going to start this discussion at 6.30 p.m. And we're going to be finished at 8.30. You know what I mean? So who knows? Yeah. Now it's time for Cheek of the Week, where we talk about something we like that we want to share with each other and with you. My cheek this week is very appropriate for all the interesting things happening to people's bodies, like (laughs) Nazca and Locke. (laughs) It's a human skeleton shower curtain that I have right now. It's up in my bathroom. It has the front and the back of the human skeleton and all the bones are labeled. So while you're showering, you can learn. And I'm assuming this is a drawing and not a photo. Uh, That is correct because that'd be (laughs) disgusting. (laughs) That's kind of what I was thinking. (laughs) But I usually have some sort of educational shower curtain up in my bathroom. Mm -hmm. Like the periodic table. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I had before this one. Um, I remember. I know a few more than I did before, which is great. I don't know all of them, but I usually keep them up for like a year. And then before mm-hmm. that, I had uh, the world map. Awesome. With all the countries labeled. There are all kinds you can get. You can get a ton of different uh, ones. I think my next one might be a dinosaur shower Ooh. curtain, which mm-hmm. sounds really exciting. For your um, octopus bathroom, you should get like a deep sea animal yeah. theme. That'd be fun. I think that'd be nice. The whole, I have a, a new bathroom in my basement and it's cephalopod themed. And <sighs> fancy schmancy. Awesome. <laughs> it's so rad. Cephalopod. <laughs> well, you have to get squids and octopuses and cuttlefish, so. Aren't they octopi? It's weird. So I looked it up once because I was wondering okay. if it was octopi. Apparently, this is a weird thing to know, I feel like. Apparently, <laughs> octopus is uh, one of the weird words that doesn't have... The Latin base, so it wouldn't be octopi, though that is accepted. It's octopodes or octopuses. Either of those works. Octopodes? I like that. I know. It's so strange. Octopodes. But you know if you said that, like, in a conversation with other people, they'd be like, what are you talking about? Pretty sure they would. Even if it's, even if that's correct. Octopodes. I love it. Yeah. What's your cheat? (laughs) Is it octopodes? Do you have octopodes? uh, 
Unfortunately, no, it has nothing to do with uh, deep sea animals. That is really sad. I know. And it actually doesn't have anything to do with uh, the lies of La Clamora. It just has to do with my life in general. So... Uh, I have created a sort of work uniform for myself, um, and I definitely suggest this to other people too. I wear pretty much the same thing every day, and it's like one less decision to make. What I wear is a polo, jeans, and a pair of Converse, and my Converse always are the same color as my polo. So I have navy blue and black and gray and green and um, a lot of maroon Converse. and purple. Yes. Okay, so I wear Converse <laughs> pretty much every day. I love them. And I found these super cool shoelaces that I don't even know why they call them shoelaces. They're not shoelaces. They're like like a, a rubber, I don't even I don't even know what the word is for what I'm trying to say. But you each side of it hooks into a hole on your shoe. And so it makes the shoes slip on. Oh, There's no nice. tying. They just stretch. Um they're called Homar no tie shoelaces. Um, I got them on Amazon. They're eight dollars for enough for a pair of shoes, nice. which is too super reasonable. And I put them on a couple of my pairs of Converse, and then I actually got a pair for my um, running shoes. And it's just, I never have to worry about if I'm going to trip over my laces because for whatever reason, you know how you just have weird things you're paranoid about? I'm always worried that when I'm on the treadmill, I'm going to trip over my shoelaces. They're going to come uh, untied yeah. and I'm not going to realize it and I'm going to fall in front of everybody and I'll never be <laughs> able to go back to the gym again. <laughs> That's a lot of steps. It's, yeah, <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Which I don't really like going to the gym, so that might not be the best, the, the worst thing ever. Maybe. <laughs> anyway, um, so you can get them in black and white and gray and light blue and dark blue and they have kid sizes and they have multicolor and they have green and orange and they're just it, it took me like two minutes to put them in my shoes really they come with this weird little tool but I actually lost it the first time I got them so I just did it without it it's really easy to do and then you just slip your shoes on and off I mean it's nice. and not only that but your your my converse look so much tidier because oh. there's no lace I mean there's no bow I I love them so much now that's my cheek some. of the week yeah, you should get some. I need I to get even more because I want to have enough for all my shoes now. Yeah. I've even seen pictures that people have posted like in the reviews and stuff. They put them on dress shoes, like men's, oh, yeah. like black shoes, and they just put black laces in and they're just really tidy. So yeah, I definitely recommend those. I'm definitely going to put a link to those because for eight bucks, right? Yeah. So listeners, you can find that and all the rest of our Cheeks of the Week, and you can send us your questions on our website, somethingcheekypodcast.com. And also, we've got a Facebook page, and people have been liking it and following us, and we're so appreciative. And if you haven't done that yet, you should definitely do it. That's our episode. Please leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts, and you can follow us on Twitter at Some Cheek. And you can also check out our other podcast where we talk about the TV show Vikings. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Do-ga-da-dum, do-ga-da-da-da-dum. <laughs>